Nej, en helt nødvendig podcast. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Og for det godt kæmpe for last two episodes. <laughs> <laughs> If there's anyone that you would like consider a blue, he's that fat pig from um the Wallabies. <laughs> what's um what's his name? I remember I kind of walked into the sheds and I was. Who's like, this guy with a filthy lit, mullet? Literally, uh, filthy <laughs> mullet, chip tooth. <laughs> sorry, bro, nah. sorry, sorry, bro. That's me, bro. Just yeah. <laughs> the goon. Yeah. Everyone's got it. Everyone's got head noise. Head yeah. noise podcast. Subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be episode 11 with Alex Noble. I fight, you fight. Thank you very much for coming, brother. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Excited to chat. Mate, so I've the reason why I asked you to come on today is because I sort of, we've known each other in um the, you know, year seven, like, you know, year eight when um, we're playing um rugby against each other. And your story is like super inspiring. You know what I mean? And And you've obviously been through something um super heavy but you've decided that that's not that's not the end of it you know what i mean like that's not the end of your story and you've come out you know with this amazing book um that we'll get to shortly but um i sort of just want to start a little bit before that about you know just where you grew up like what was your journey like what was your journey to you know how we met and then you know from there so yeah so i grew up in sydney australia and um born in Um, I started living in East Ride till I was three. Then I moved to um, Tennyson Point, which is like the Ride Glazel area. And then that was up until I was uh, 16. And so, yeah, throughout my life up until I was 16, I was, you know, just a typical, you know, sporty kid. I had blonde hair, was tanned, athletic, oh, fit, what? healthy. <laughs> um, you know, just loved footy, played Well, everything I did was to do with footy. And if I wasn't playing or training footy, I'd be like watching JT's highlights or something <laughs> like, you know. Um, yeah, and so it was just my whole life dedicated around footy. And other than that, it was, you know, eating to get big, you know, just a typical kid. And then other than that, it would just be, you know, ha hanging out with friends, having fun, going out, getting with girls, going to parties. I um, mean, it was a good life. It was a perfect life, really. Um, everything was easy. You know, had no issues ever. The only issues that I ever had was, you know, what people thought of me and like the stress of does she think I'm good looking or how many friends can I get? That's the only difficulty or challenge that I ever had to face or the only stress or worry that I had. Literally, that's how easy my life was up until I was 16. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I was focusing on footy. My dream was to make it professionally in footy, make the NRL, make the Wallabies, you know, every kid's dream. And I thought I was, you know, getting on... I thought that was on the road to achieving that dream. You know, I started making the, well, I was making all the the top rugby teams every single mm. year at school and club. I was making all the representative teams. And when I was 16, in year 10, I got picked for the New South Wales rugby school boys and I was trialling for New South Wales sevens. And, you know, everything was on the right path to one day fulfil my dream of becoming that professional footy player. But then one morning, I guess, should we get into that now or...? Yeah, man. Like, well, I, I think, like, talk about it because that's, that's sort of the crossover that we had was around that time where me and you were both playing rep footy. We both were playing in, um, to, like, teams together or against each other. I remember um, I went to Kings, you went to Review, and we used yeah, to just... Yeah, I hated go, you, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, eh? Right? We full used, oh, to go, <laughs> we used to go so hard at each other, yeah. talking so much shit. Oh. <laughs> that's the funny But part. It was, like, massive enemies on the field. I absolutely hated each other, but then off the field, we were good. Yeah. There was always a slight little thing, just like, oh, I'll get back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time you want to go yeah. back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I remember, as, as you were saying... Um, when uh, you got selected for the Rugby Sevens, right? And I remember you were on, um, it was a trial, trial game. So yeah, maybe dive into that, just what would happen, just, just yeah, a normal so, day, right? Like just normal footy. Yeah, so like I said, on the road to fulfilling that dream and then one Sunday morning, um, it was the 21st of October, 2018. And we had this New South Wales Rugby Sevens training game. It was, it was more of like a um, trial and It was at Knox College, at Knox Oval on the first field. And I remember we began the training session nice and early that morning. It was, um, yeah, we just started warming up with all the players. I think I was playing two years up. So it was the, yeah, Opens New South Wales Seven. So it was like a big thing, like mm. playing two years up. And um, I remember me and a few of my other mates who were like my age, who were younger, we were like kind of just warming up on our own. like nervous in front of all the older <laughs> boys who were like so much better, or not better, but older and, you know, more experienced. And so, yeah, I remember we were just, warming up in ourselves like with ourselves and staying clear of all the older boys and 
I remember it was a really like overcast and like cold Sunday morning. It was, you know, cloudy and like nearly raining, but not quite. And eventually after the warm up, we did a couple of drills, typical drills. About halfway through the um, training session or the trials, we began playing a 7v7 opposed game. So like a full contact game of sevens rugby where the coaches and the selectors would utilize that game to select the team. So, you know, it was a big moment and um, yeah, big period where it could be a make it or break it for my kind of future in rugby and to, you know, becoming that rugby player that I wanted to be. So it was really important to me and I'm sure all the other boys. And I remember we began this um, game and we were defending for the first 10 or so minutes straight on our line, just defending set after set after set. And finally my teammate was on the left of me and he got a pilfer and turned the ball over. So it was like finally our turn to attack. And so he grabbed the ball and just before he got tackled, he passed it to me and it was a nice long pass. Must have been like 10, 15 meter pass. Came out to me right in front of my chest. I caught in two hands and I tucked it on my right arm. And then in front of me was the defender. And so to kind of, you know, avoid being tackled by him and get past him to go score a try or, you know, make some meters. Um, I chucked a goose step, which you would know what a goose step is, but <laughs> for, <laughs> for anyone that doesn't know what a goose step is, um, you know, it's like when you're running yeah. really fast and then yeah, step slow to the down. Side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you speed up again. You, yeah, I just did like destabilize the defender. So I did this goose step to, you know, get around the defender. And at the same time, I stuck my left arm out to fend him in the chest to push him away mm. and palm him off. But as I went to palm him off, the player grabbed onto my wrist with his right hand and grabbed my shoulder with his left hand. So he had full control of my arm. And with my arm, he pulled it and yanked it straight down to the floor. And so it caused me to smash the left side of my cheek straight into the dirt of the floor. And as my head hit the ground first, the momentum of the tackle carried the rest of my body over the top of my head as my head stayed still. And then you know, the next thing I know is I was just laying there in the middle of that Knox College Oval, flat on my back, looking up to gloomy, cloudy skies and... 30 of my teammates and coaches were standing around me just looking down at me and as I looked up to them and my whole body kind of just started vibrating and everything went numb and everything literally just went cold and silent in my life and soon after that I realized that you know I couldn't move a single muscle at all except my eyeballs and so I remember lying there in the middle of that oval that morning and I remember seeing in my peripheral vision, my arm was out to my right, but I felt like my arm was up above in the air in front of me. Mm. And so when I thought my arm was up above me and I saw my arm over there, I knew that something was not right. It wasn't just a normal injury, like a, you know, AC joint or ACL or a cut or something. It was something much more worse than that. But then it was also a part of me that didn't really realize the extent of the injury because I said to the physio who was holding my head um, to prevent me from moving my head to damage my neck even more. And I said to him, am I going to be right for footy training tomorrow morning for the footy trials? Because I remember at Riverview, we had our first 15 trials that next Monday morning. So I said, am I going to be sweet for tomorrow? Thinking he was going to say yes. And he just didn't reply to me. And I remember that's because probably he knew what was going to happen, what my future beholded. And so that morning at Knox Oval on the 21st of October is when I went from that, you know, young, fit, healthy, athletic, good footy player to a quadriplegic where I broke my neck, C4 quadriplegic for the rest of my life. And that moment is where my whole life changed forever. Mm. And and thank you for like sharing with me the story, man. Uh, I know it's a very very like big thing in your life and it's in it's shaped who you are today and and that's and that's where your journey is now and i sort of want to get into depth because why this episode is so important i feel is as you know already there's a lot of kids who are in your position a lot of adults a lot of people that are in a similar position not not a lot but there's people in in the journey that you've gone through or going through or in a similar field and i think it's really important how you 
like you said, you had so much detail about what happened. You completely understood what happened and now you're shaping your life and moving forward from it. And that's so inspiring. I, I want to sort of, if you don't mind talking about it, I want to ask, you know, when you realized like on the ground, like this is more serious than it was, were, were like, what were your thoughts then? Were, were you still like, oh, well, this, you know, it's a rare injury. Like that, you know, becoming a quadriplegic is, is, is a very rare injury. That's not going to happen to me. And, and that journey from moving forward to the realization, having those chats, what, what was that like, you know? Cause yeah. that's something that's a lot of people will never experience, but the people that do experience, and especially young, you know, there's a young girl out there who might've hurt herself or, you know, or young boy out there. And I think it's really important that you can give them those steps to move forward from that. I think that's really important. So I'd love to know from, from when you realized that you, you know, had this injury, like what was the journey like in the ambulance or when you're at hospital or what yeah. were those conversations, if you could talk about them? Yeah, well, I'll 100% get into that. But I think first thing is that, you know, how you said like that injury shaped me and who I am today. I think for people that are out there get, that get injured, it, it's not the injury that shapes you and your future. It's your response to that injury that yeah. then shapes you yeah. and your future. So I think because... You, it, when you get injured, that could completely ruin the rest of your life, or make you it have so many different results. Yeah, but yeah. Sorry, it's all, sorry. It all I depends should, on. So I didn't mean to, to I didn't mean to say it like that. I meant, I meant like the that um injury is like turning you yeah. into this person. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you, like you, you. The growth that you've got out of this is amazing. Yeah. You know, you're reaching stress that you've never put. So I didn't mean it to come across no, no, like that. No, before. I just want to say for the people out there that are listening yeah. that do get injured in any certain way, whether that's AC or a spinal cord injury or a broken ankle you know yeah. it's like that isn't going to define you in your future or mm. that's not going to shape mm. who you become it's your response to that injury that then shapes who you become so i think it's really important that people do know that because a lot of people when they get injured they're like shit this is me now or shit this is what my future beholds or oh no i'm gonna not make that team anymore but it's like no it what your future beholds depends on how you respond to that injury. So I think that's really important for people to know that you have that power always, no matter how bad the injury is, even if you become a quadriplegic, your life can still be incredible and amazing. It's just if you choose to have that future, you know? Um, anyway, I think that's really important. I just had to say that. No, man, I, that, that's extremely important. I think that's re- like, I think that's a lot of people who are in your position might need to hear that, you know? Some people watching yeah. this might- Because it's might so need- easy to feel just like, play the victim card and like, shit unfair why me and then the rest of their futures goes uh my life wasn't supposed to be good it's like it can be good if you just get rid of that victim card and stop saying it's unfair and take responsibility and accountability and define your own life you know what i mean like you have that power always fucking hell wow no, that's not, that's, fine. that's gonna be a clip that's gonna be a clip that's getting clipped up for sure man i 100 percent agree with, i agree with you man like that's it's fucking you're the perfect person to say it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. cause that is it's so true. It's so true. But even not even with injuries though, like say anything, man, say anything. anything. Yeah. Like your parents get divorced, mm. you know, your brother dies, your anything really, even something like, even if you fail at an exam, mm. it's not just injury related. It's whenever you face a difficulty, that difficulty isn't going to define what happens to you and what your future beholds and who you are going to become. Mm. It's whatever you, however you respond to that difficulty that then, defines you become you know what i mean so mate, i agree i agree a thousand percent mate you're preaching preaching gospel right there uh, i think that's really important for people to, yeah 100 um um yeah, yeah back let's talk to your question yeah, yeah yeah sorry sorry <laughs> no that was good great se- great good, segue yeah. great yeah. segue <laughs> um so yeah i think yeah like i said when i got injured and i was laying there flat on my back unable to move a single muscle that split second that sunday morning at knox i did yeah like i said to the physio am I still going to be right for training tomorrow? So I was mm. still unsure. I didn't realize how bad it was. Um, and even when I got in the ambulance and I, was, I got on the stretcher and then on the ambulance and then to hospital and then just like run, uh, in the trolley down the hospital hallways into the exo room, into the MRI room um, and then knocked out in a four-day coma with, spinal cord injury, with a spinal surgery and I woke up in that intensive care unit four days later um, still unable to move and throughout the whole process I was in ICU still unable to move or talk or breathe or drink or anything like that I still didn't really 
no, I still wasn't aware that I was a quadriplegic or I wasn't aware that I was not going to be able to, I was going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And I think the reason, I think I knew it, but I just chose not to look that far forward in my life that mm. my, my life is it going to be a quadriplegia now. I'm going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I'm not going to be able to do all these things. But what I did, and I think what was very important and powerful and beneficial as to what I did is I just was so present and I just focused on me at that very point in time. I didn't look back at my life and say, oh, I wish I was back like the Alex Noble where I was fit and healthy and could run around and happy and having fun or playing footy. And I wasn't like, oh, I wish I could go back there or, you know, I wish this didn't happen to me. So I wasn't reflecting back on everything that I lost because I knew that that would completely destroy me and imprison me and, you know, prevent me from being able to go forward in my life. And another important thing I did is I didn't look forward either. I didn't look forward to that overwhelming road ahead of me mm. of all of those hours and hours and hours and hours of hard work in the gym trying to recover and rehab. I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't looking forward to a whole life ahead of me where I'm in a wheelchair rolling around the streets in a wheelchair because I knew that would also imprison me and destroy me and be like, that life sucks. Mm. What I did is just made a conscious, real conscious effort to just stay fixed on the present, um, accept things as they come, learn as I go, just focus on small goal by small goal. And that is what enabled me to continually strive forward when everyone from an external point of view would say, you have every right to give up right now. And I probably did have every right to give up because it's a gnarly, horrible situation where you know it would have been fair enough for me to give up and not go forward because it's fucking way too hard, you know what I mean? But that's why I didn't look back and I didn't look forward. I just focused on the small things which were achievable. And I remember lying in that intensive care unit and literally unable to do a single thing. I couldn't even breathe on my own, you know? All I could do was my eyes, okay? So I realized that and I said, all right, I can control my eyes. So um, I remember seeing this red digital clock in the left side of my corner and because I couldn't move my head at all on the pillow because, you know, I was unable to move mm. at all, I couldn't actually see the time on the clock. But I made it my first goal when I woke up was to try and achieve the goal of seeing the time on that clock. And so for the next 24 or more hours, it must have been like 36 hours, I spent every minute trying to see the time on that clock. Wow, really? Yeah, that's all I did, just focus on the next smaller goal that I could achieve. Finally, after that 36 hour, I saw the time on that clock. And then as soon as I saw the time on that clock, I don't remember what the time was, but then I was straight on to the next task, the next goal that I could achieve, the next small one that was achievable, you know? And that was to relearn how to breathe again. And then once I finally relearned how to breathe again on my own after another, I think, two and a half, three days, then it was on to the next to relearn how to talk, how to drink, how to eat. And then wow. by that strategy, by doing that strategy and implementing that strategy, that's what enabled me to carry on when everyone else thought I couldn't. You know? Wow, man. So, so, a little, so you're saying the small achievable goals, just daily, just daily things is what just kept your mind active and kept you ticking over, you know, in, in yeah. those moments. When, when you're, you know, talking about um, learning to breathe again, how does that process like, how does that work? Yeah, well... So that sounds very Yeah, it was it was probably the one of the scariest periods of my life, hundred percent was. Would you say it's the hard, one of the hardest parts of the whole journey? Is, is I think definitely great? the scariest. Wow. The hardest, no, because machines were doing it for me. But oh, definitely yeah, the okay. scariest. Yeah, okay. So I like, it was obviously very hard still, but some of the other stuff I have to go through or had to go through with, you know, training and recovering was very mentally and physically challenging but the very learning to breathe again was very challenging but also definitely the most scariest or well, the scariest yeah. um so, that so yeah I'll, i guess it's, you'll never really understand but i'll try my best to yeah, yeah. explain it yeah. um so pretty much started with um you know tubes in my neck and down my throat mm. to help me breathe which are all connected to the machine so they were doing the breath, breathing for me when i couldn't because the injury was so high up here so i had no shoulders and no diaphragm and no lungs and nothing except my eyes, like I said. Um, and my ears worked too. I could hear things. Yeah. Um, and then I remember, yeah, after like the third day, the doctors came in and they said to me, 
all right, we're going to try and get Alex to start trying to breathe again on his own. And I remember hearing that and I'm like, like, well, yeah, I, I heard it and I could see the doctor, but I was so scared to try and breathe again on my own because I couldn't, I didn't know how to, I didn't, mm. I had no lungs. I couldn't feel my lungs. So I was like, how is that going to work? What am I going to do? It's not going to work. Like if we take these tubes out, I'm gone. You know what I mean? Good so right. I thought that if the, they took these tubes out, like the doctor saying he's going to do, mm. like I would die right now, literally. So it's, that's what I mean by being scared. And mm. so I wanted to tell the doctor that to not do it, to tell him, no, I'm not ready. I can't do it. I can't feel my lungs. Um, but I couldn't speak to him. Mm. So he was going to do this thing without my Fuck, consent at all. Scary, so I'm just there like trying to use my eyes to say no by doing my eyes like this way, like this way, like a, like actioning a nod of the head or a shake of the head. Yeah. Oh, is that, is that trying so, to replicate it? Sorry, sorry. Right before you jump in, is that how you communicated with your eyes or was Oh, it? no, I couldn't communicate. Well, I was trying to. So you know how you shake your head? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I was trying yeah. to do that with my eyes. Yeah. But he didn't really realize that, but right, I couldn't okay. tell him. So okay. that's what I was trying to do to say, to tell him to say, right, no, okay. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Yeah. But um, he proceeded anyway. And so we took them. Um, tubes and cords out of my neck and my throat and um yeah shitting myself <laughs> we transitioned from that and then when that came out i had a few like split seconds in between transferring the tubes helping me breathe to a big mask helping connected to a machine helping me breathe well, okay. and that split second was pretty much where i was like just holding my breath well, and just hoping that they get the mask on in time and so the mask finally got on and that I was going to say it was relieving, but that kind of wasn't relieving either because using that, mas that mask and that machine was so scary too because I had to time practicing my breath at the same time the uh, mask so sucks you. in and yeah. sucks out. So yes, I was able to get from one machine to the other to the mask, but then I wasn't really relieved because then I had to perfectly time every millisecond. Otherwise, if I time it incorrectly, I was off by a millisecond then... I would choke and oh. miss time the breath and then again suffocate, you know what I mean? So it was really traumatic and scary and, you know, like a nightmare really. Wow. Um, but then it was called a CPAP. It was like an acute CPAP mask where it's like over your whole um, chin, mouth and nose and it pushes air into your lung or in through your mouth into your lungs and that's when you've got to try and act at the same time and breathe in oh, it was and then and then after a few seconds it sucks it all out of your lungs and mouth and you've got to try and at the same time okay. so it's like for the next five days or so it was like like that for like five wow. days and during the day was obviously like a nightmare but I had people around me, like nurses, mm. um, who were there to like monitor. In it, case yeah. I did stuff up yeah. the timing by a millisecond, they were there to catch me and connect it again properly and help me breathe again. Yep. In case I stuffed up, but at night times it was a whole other story when no one else was around, and if I did choke, if I did miss time it, well then I'll be gone. So I was just so scared for anyone to leave me. But at night time, obviously they had to. Um, so yeah, those nights where it was just completely pitch black in the room, silent and all I heard and all I did was <sighs> for just hours. And so I wouldn't sleep at all just because I was so scared mm. about falling asleep because then I wouldn't be able to breathe at the same time. Um, Could you sleep? Could you sleep with that machine? No, nah, I didn't sleep with that machine. So how, how long were you awake with that? Was that machine like a, how long was that for? That was like um, five days, but the, probably the first three days I didn't sleep. But Fucking then after, hell, you didn't sleep for yeah. three days. Wow, man. Yeah, that wow. no, was pretty gnarly. Did the, um, did the doctor say to you like, you, when you do fall asleep, like your body will do it like it's practicing or was he saying- Well, like, I think the idea is to start practicing and training mm. my lungs. Yeah. So after the third day, then I'll get better and better, right. relearning how to breathe and then I could kind of become more naturally and subconscious. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that was the idea. Um, another thing is with like notifying the nurses if I did have to, you know, fix the mask mm. or- in case I mistimed it, I had like this, well, usually in hospital, there's buzzers right on the wall. Everyone's been in hospital. 
you press that call buzzer on the wall. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. To get the yeah, nurses yeah, to come. Yeah, yeah. But because I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't press the call button. Right. So then they tried to manufacture a device where I could call the nurse. And so they thought we're like next to the bed, hit it with my hand, but I couldn't move my hand a centimeter, so I couldn't do that. And then we tried to get this buzzer near my head where I could hit it with my head. Right. But because I couldn't move my head either, I couldn't do that. So there was just like not really any hope for me um, being able to call the nurses. So that's what I mean by why it was so scary as well. Um, wow, that must have been um, uh, crazy to be in a situation where like you can't even hit the button. You know what I mean? Like there's no, so you're really just reliant on yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's, mm. fuck that, like you said, that, that just was completely been, vulnerable and, you know, just on the verge of dying really. Wow. wow. But I think that's why also like nowadays it's just like, if I come across a difficulty, I'm just like, it's not that bad. If you come across what, sorry? A difficulty, like oh, a challenge. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Well, fuck. Oh, yeah, I've been the worst, that's right. Yeah, yeah, fuck, well, the Blues don't win. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, that's exactly right. That's why you need difficulties in life and challenges. They're important and essential to enable you to experience happiness mm. and joy, you know what I mean? Because without difficulties, you're never going to be able to experience joy. So when difficulties come people's way and challenges come your way and obstacles and life tries to knock you down, you know, don't say, I don't want to go through it or why me. Say, okay, this is, I need this. This is life, you know, teaching me how to, you know, find happiness because it's only when you go through those challenging times are the only times when you can experience those good times. It's like yin and yang, you know, the Chinese Mate, 100%. philosophy. Mate, exactly yeah. like that. So, talk, talk about philosophy. Did you, in this process, find like faith or find like, you know, rely on the universe or was there some sort of like, you know, power that sort of made you feel this way or was there not did you not find faith or did you not find these things like what, what was that journey like you know yeah well initially so i used to be um you know catholic i used to go to church every sunday but that was more because mum made me you know yeah <laughs> every sunday every sunday evening yeah, yeah. 6 p.m so oh really Byron, right? you, yeah. you would go as a family to the church yeah, yeah oh yeah, yeah okay we tr- yeah we yeah are we, you irish irish or oh irish, irish like yeah, like I think my great grandparents are yeah, Irish. Yeah. My family used to do the Catholic Irish. Yeah, no, yeah they're yeah. full on. <laughs> hey, they're so full. Yeah, on. but we like never used to be like really Catholic at all. Like, yeah, yeah. We'd go because we had to. Never right. really like church. Okay. Hated it to be honest. <laughs> but um, the initial stages and the acute stages of the injury and like the early say few months is where I really lent on God, mm. just because I couldn't lean on myself or I had so I was just complete faith or praying to God to help me because I can't help myself type of thing. So heaps and heaps of prayers, heaps of, you know, people bring me like Mary McKillop things all the time and rosary beads. Oh. So there's a lot of, yeah, faith going on there. But since my accident up until where I am today and for the rest of my life, I have become way more religious. But when I say religious, I don't go to church anymore at all. I don't believe in going to church. Even with all the Bible stuff, like I'm not massively into it, but I still pray to God like literally eight times a day, every day. Oh, wow. Yeah, literally. Like I never used to pray at all. But nowadays, at least eight times a day. Um, you don't, so what I'm hearing is, and I'm very similar. What you just said is exactly what, how I feel. You have faith, but you don't believe in religion. You don't, you don't believe in the structure of going to church or having someone sort of tell you how to yeah. communicate with, you know, the higher power, whatever that may be, if it's Jesus, God, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, I feel like why do I have to go to church to speak to God when the world is like church? So this is God's world, he could, like, God is everywhere with you at all times. So wherever I am, I can reach out to God and talk to God because he's always with me. I don't have to go to church to speak to him, you know what I mean? mean. Sure, it's his home, but this is his home too in my house. My my man, you're you're preaching. I love it, brother. I love it. But um, I think I also do a lot of prayer, not just because like religion, blah, 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 like whoever's out there that doesn't believe in religion, you probably think like, you know, oh, no, you can't relate. But it's a great meditation strategy. Mm. it's a great um reflection strategy and it enables you to always you know self-reflect be self-aware and also can help you get through challenges when they arise and also when you do win for example when things are good you can also pray through those times because it helps you appreciate those times more and helps you to be aware of okay this is a good time you know when i'm in a bad time so remember these moments it's just good meditation and reflection strategy so even if you don't believe in god like it's still good to pray or don't even call it pray just self reflection or 
yeah. whatever you want to call it. But that's the way I say it, you know. Um, it's a good way to just be always aware and present of life and live life, not by just going through, you know, just going through life for the sake of going through life, but actually going through life with a purpose and a meaning. Mm, yeah. Thing. Um, not just go through the motions not just go through the motions not just doing 9 to 5 not just go on the hamster cycle of wake up same thing go to bed but also wake up do something for a reason why you're doing it you know what I mean mm. have a why I think that prayer or meditation and self reflection enables you to always have reason have meaning have that why throughout life yeah yeah that's amazing man and um, and just just um, I just had this question just come to me I was just thinking what was your relationship with like um people um like with a disability before your injury right did was that ever like have anyone with a disability in your family or just like anything like what was your relationship with that i don't know why i just i just thought nah, that question. question yeah yeah um yeah i never met a quadriplegic at all mm. until i became one yeah well. literally like it, i didn't even think i met someone in a wheelchair to be honest like yeah, well. i was completely unaware of anything to do with quadriplegia um, but like in hindsight, I think that was beneficial for me in my recovery process yeah, right. and my response to my injury because I was oblivious as to all the challenges a quadriplegic faces. Um, I was so oblivious to, you know, the little things that no one knows about that you wouldn't even know about that people listening would have no idea about Like, Yeah, sure. Sucks to be in a wheelchair, sucks to roll around, blah, blah, blah. But there's so much more than that, which only now I realize. Mm. And so, yeah, in hindsight, like I said, I think that was good for me because I could, you know, try my very best to recover and strive forward and um, try to be become the best person I can be without the knowledge of all of the fine difficulties that I have to face, the ones mm. that people don't know about. So, yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah, no, I man, I just, I just came to me. I was just wondering, like, if it would have helped, but clearly not yeah. having anything, it actually helped not having to know, yeah. you know? But I think like even now, like um, like when I meet people all the time, able-bodied people, they, I've realized how oblivious they are too of the things I have to experience. Everyone knows I'm in a wheelchair, but like I said, so much deeper than that. And so many people don't really realize all the little things that come along with quadriplegia. This is, and so you know what, what you're about to say, I think is really good. Can you talk on those things? What are yeah. things that, you know, like you said, like someone like me, where I've, I've never been experienced, or even you before your injury, where you've never, never really interacted with someone in a wheelchair or, you know, someone um, with this um, injury. So what, like, what are things that are annoying and like yeah. not good or what things that are really respectful? Yeah. Cause I, cause I've obviously I've known you. We Sometimes I see you out like on a night out or something and like, I, I know like it, you know, it's okay. Like to, you know, slap your arm, give you a handshake, like give you a pat on the back, like be respectful. But are there things that people do that yeah. are, are not good? You know what yeah. I mean? hundred percent. That's, it's good. I think it's a really important topic to talk about because when people are not knowledgeable about, you know, things to do with quadriplegia, yeah. it's like, you're not, it's not your fault, you know. I used to be the exact same as yeah. you. You're just unaware. You just don't know. Yeah. Because you haven't been exposed to it. So I think it's really good to talk about these things because now when you see someone in a wheelchair, when you meet someone and you want to have a conversation with them, you know, um, it's not like they're different at all. They're just another human. Yeah, but yeah. A lot of people wig out a little bit just because they're unaware. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's not their fault. Like I used to be the same. I would have yeah, no idea. Yeah. Um, What's well, just education? Yeah, and just because yeah. you're not, there's not yeah. many people in a wheelchair. Well, no. there actually are heaps, but yeah, relative to the amount of other yeah. people in the world. Um, but yeah, I guess some things that people wouldn't know about is like, obviously the things of sitting in a wheelchair, blah, blah, blah. But then also like, like I get really bad nerve pain, for example, okay. from like here down, like my hands, like my legs. Um, and it's hard to explain the feeling, but it's like kind of sitting on a hot pan with oil on it. It's oh. you're like, so yeah, sitting on a hot pan, the best way to describe it. Um, just always kind of burning. Um, and it gets really bad with like long pants, for example. Um, like I hate wearing long pants. Like right now I'm wearing shorts and pineapple socks because <laughs> I hate wearing long pants. Um, that's not... Is it like the century? The century yeah, I think it's just when yeah. stuff's touching it, like even with my shorts. Um, right. But I think that's not the same with every quadriplegia. Oh, you know? really? Okay. It depends. It's all... It, that's the thing with spinal cord injuries too. Is like, yeah, it's a spinal cord injury. Same kind of injury, but 
everyone is so different. Like there's no yeah. one like me at all. There's no one like someone else. Like this, like for example, even when you break your neck, like I'm C4 mm. and which means that it's like the, um, the fourth vertebrae, cervical yeah. vertebrae. And so there's C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. Then it goes in the T's, pretty much goes downwards, right? And so like one vertebrae higher, C3, like I wouldn't be able to move my arms at all right now. You know what I mean? I'd yeah, be able okay. to do this. That's it. Wow. Okay. So massive, like a millimeter makes such a big difference. And like if I was C5, I'd be able to grab this microphone with my hands, but I can't because yeah, yeah, okay. my hands don't work. Right. Okay. And I'd be able to, you know, have triceps and, you know, probably like punch you in the face. But <laughs> <laughs> Some doozy arms on yeah. you. <laughs> like, yeah, like proper strong. But um, yeah, so yeah, the tiniest little bit difference in a injury makes it a completely different yeah, well. lifestyle and quality of life and different abilities, you know what I mean? Um, other things like pressure sores, like a big thing is avoiding pressure sores on like, for example, your bum because you're sitting down all day, right, you get a yeah. red mark. Like for example, right now after you sit, like stand up after this podcast, mm. you'd stand up, if you pulled down your pants, you'd probably have a red mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And five minutes later, be gone. But for someone sitting down all day, every day, if you get a red mark, and then you sit on that red mark for longer yeah, and never sore. gets any air, then it never recovers kind mm. of thing. And then when it doesn't recover, and becomes in, it goes from a red mark into a pressure sore and that's when it can get really bad and you have to go on bed rest and pretty much line your side so the red mark is in the air because obviously you can't walk around and when you're walking around, your bum's in the air, but you're sitting down all day, so you have to be on your side in bed. Um, you know, and this, the healing process too is slower because there's less blood flow. Yeah. So like I know someone that's been in bed for seven years on their side. Wow. literally staring at a wall on their side for seven years because they had a pressure sore in their bum that was infected. And I remember when I was in rehab, I got a red mark on my bum and I had to lie on my side. It was Thursday morning. I started lying on my side and I was there all the way till Monday afternoon. What? And like that was a really excruciating process. I destroyed my shoulders, I was staring at a wall the whole time. The same to, side. Couldn't really, couldn't eat myself. Like, yeah, on the same side. But you can roll to the other side. Yeah, but can you swap sides? Yeah, you can swap sides. Well, it depends where the mic is, but yeah. still, like, it just destroys your shoulders. Stuck in bed horizontal, can't do anything, can't use a laptop or your phone Fuck. or eat properly. So it's excruciating, horrible process. And that was only, what, four, four and a bit days. Whereas some other people do months on end. Somebody just said seven, seven years. Seven years on end, yeah. So big thing is to, yeah, press the doors. Um, other things, yeah, like, um, like for example, feet swelling because they're not moving oh, yeah. and they're just stuck in the same spot. Um, feet swelling, which is also very painful, um, could list could go on, but yeah. yeah, yeah. But the one thing I'd say is like, when you know, greeting or well, not with greeting, but just someone that hasn't met someone that's in a wheelchair before, yeah. like don't act weird around them or anything like that. No, yeah, like they're yeah. exactly yeah. Who, like you are. Just sitting down, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like slap them up. Like yeah, yeah. Whack them in the face, you know? They're like they're just exactly like you, but yeah, sitting yeah. down, you know what I mean? So it's it's not it's not really the yeah, I get what you're saying. It's not really the social interaction of like what to do, because when people start wigging out and going, Oh, what do I do? That's yeah. when it gets weird. We're yeah. just that casual, you know what I mean? Yeah, just yeah. create the same thing. Cause I remember when um when uh sort of earlier on um in injury when I, I saw you out one night, but you you didn't have as good mobility of your arms and hands. Mm. And, and that was something for me of like realizing is like, what's the like appropriate thing to do? You know what I mean? Because like if I saw you, like I'd always just slap you up, you know, and, and now obviously you've got better mobility. Like this, I'm talking about ages ago, yeah, yeah. but I, I didn't really know that process. And then, um, but it's good to know. So it was just like, what I did, yeah. I just put a hand on your shoulder yeah, yeah. and I was like, you know what I mean? Just cause yeah. so, you know, I was reaching out to yeah. show, show yeah. some sort of affection. Yeah. hundred you percent. Know? I think a lot of people as well, like I know when I was like before I was sixteen or before my injury, I when I thought of someone in a wheelchair, I think of like a paraplegic, like they can move mm. their arms, you can grab, yeah, use their yeah, hands. Like yeah. Like you don't think quadriplegic is a legs, thing. It's just legs, yeah. Like I didn't really know quadriplegic was a thing until I became one. Like I knew what a person in a wheelchair was, and I just yeah. assumed they would be able to move their arms. Just their legs don't work. You know what I mean? Mm. Just like a Family Guy, that dude. Everyone picture yeah, that guy. Yeah, yeah, Joe. Literally, <laughs> people would actually do that. Like yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, like yeah. oh, if you're in a wheelchair, you're just similar to that guy. Yeah. Um. But, you know, there's quads out there too who either can't move their arms or can't move their hands or can move a bit of their hand and not the other one or mm. their left arm can move or the right one can't as much or, you know, it's all so different. 
But um, yeah, I guess. I don't know. That's how I used to say. I think a lot yeah. of people would think that too. Oh, that I agree 100%. wheelchair para can move their arms, but yeah. you know, it's all completely different and relative. Yeah. Is it is there something that like annoys you that people do? Like, so is there something that like when people like when they first see like obviously obviously the awkwardness and that stuff that but that might be some people trying to be nice too. Is there something like um that you that you know you should tell people that they might be doing that they don't know that they're doing? You know what I mean or like just in social situations or like because well, i think what people actually get wrong too is you like it doesn't stop you from going out like I've, we said it a few times like we see each other regularly when, with our mates you know go out or something and we'll see each other at and that's something that i think people get wrong too is that just you know just because of this injury you don't go out anymore yeah or you don't go have fun and do all these things like that's not the case you know what yeah. i mean well i think the number one thing and probably the only thing that actually somewhat maybe irritates me when people deal and think of like a person in a wheelchair is that people in society so often think that people in wheelchairs are inferior and they mm. treat them in like b- treat them as being inferior to them and that's not a conscious thing it's probably just subconscious and just natural you know because i don't know the less able than you the less powerful than you less strong and they just all of a sudden treat you inferior and it's 100 percent a thing like and it's natural. It's not like anyone's fault. You know what I mean? Is it um, su- is it subtle? Is it subtle? Yeah, it's subtle. Like, they don't think they're doing it. You know? Is it um, like the language? But that- I think it's just like, well, what I've what what are my main goals in life is to you know show the world, show able-bodied people in society, and show people in my situation as well that you know just because you are a quadriplegic or a paraplegic or just because you're in a wheelchair doesn't mean you can't be as good as able people. But more importantly, I want to show the world that just because you are a quadriplegic or a paraplegic or in a wheelchair doesn't mean you can't be the best human, you, the best able body. doesn't mean you can't be a, you know, Martin Luther King or a, mm. n- like a Nelson Mandela. And that's my goal is to show that w- a wheelchair isn't a limitation. The only limitations are the one that's in your own head, you know what I mean? So I think a lot of the things I do is to be the best human being that I can possibly be but also to show people in my situation that, you know, they still have the ability to be the epitome of a person. Mm. And I think a lot of people, like, yes, society thinks that, um, you know, people in wheelchairs are inferior now, but I think also people in wheelchairs think they're inferior to other people just because Depend they used it. to be better than they are now. They used to be more mm. able and, more, and stronger and mm. taller and more physically able. And so they immediately, when they get injured, they think, oh, I can't be as good anymore. Oh, I can't be a banker anymore. Oh, I can't be an athlete anymore. I can't be as good as I was. Like, no, that is so not true at all. You still have every single power in the world to be way better than you were when you're able-bodied. Don't think that you're inferior. Yes, you may think that. Yes, society may think that, but it doesn't mean you actually are. You still have the ability and the power to become the very best person in the world, really. Like, if you really put your mind to it and you really, you know, take the risk, get vulnerable... Put it and try your very, very best. You can become literally anything and anybody. Fuck man, you fired me up. I'm fired up. I want to go do something right now. You got me, got me all fired up. It's so true, man. I was just thinking. But I think people just need that to unlock. People just man, immediately put a wall up in front of them and say, "Oh, I'm in a wheelchair now. Oh, can't do something." Man, I, I just just hearing you speak just then, like the first thing that just came to my mind, I was just thinking, like, "Fuck man, we're, we're, no matter what happened to you throughout your life, you know what I mean." You are always gonna be someone of something, you know what I mean? And and fuck, just hearing you speak and just all how like how you've you know just get this message out that it doesn't matter. Like, cause there's no feeling sorry for yourself. I want to get up today. I'm gonna go do what we got to do, man. It's just it's fucking inspiring, yeah. man. It's it's inspiring. Well, because I just know that so many people like me in my situation right now are at home feeling miserable about mm-hmm. themselves, at home watching a movie or just watching some YouTube, haven't left their house in like six days just because they're feeling you know, they're playing the victim card. They feel like life's unfair or it's mistreated them or they've got the, you know, bad end of the tail or whatever the saying is. Yeah. And they feel like other people have it easier. And as a result, then they, you know, don't try and they, you know, because it's the easy option to be fair. Like it's so fair that you just go, oh, my life's harder now. I'm not going to try. Mm. Like I understand. Like it's yeah. the easy option. Like when I was in that intensive care unit, I could have easily just chose to give up, you know, would have been so much easier. Like my journey, my road, and my process is 
have been extraordinarily hard, like so difficult. But, you know, the most difficult roads in life result in the most difficult... Let me say that again. You let out that bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most difficult roads lead to the most extraordinary places, you know? Mm. People of the greatest caliber in life have gone through the most challenging times. So, you know, yes, the easy option is to give up. But if you really want to make something of yourself in this life and, you know, capitalize upon this only one in life that you have, then, mate, get uncomfortable. Um, embrace the discomfort. Mm. Put in the hard work and you'll reap the rewards. And when you get to the end of your life, when you're 80 look, in your deathbed looking back at your life and you say, I made the most of it and you know, I have no regrets and I did my very best. But imagine that person that chose to play the victim card and chose to feel sorry for themselves and chose to not do anything their whole life. Imagine when they get to the end of their life and they're 80, lying in their bed, their deathbed, and they look back on their life and say, damn, I fucked up, man. And that's, I think, my greatest fear in life. I don't want to be that person. I want to get to the end and know that not only have I reached my absolute full potential and I've tried my very best, but also know that I've created and done something that's going to last for a lot longer than me after I die and create something that transcends this generation onto future generations and has an impact on the world forever. Leave a mark in the world, you know what I mean? Fuck, bro. That's 100%. 100, everything you just said then is 100% correct. You know what I mean? And I think... What, what I listened a lot to this podcast. It's called um, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, right? Where, yeah. And, and, and Mike, obviously, like it's a funny concept, the podcast, but he actually is quite inspiring. He talks a lot about th like that. This is the whole beauty of life. Like without the tragedies in life that you can't have the beauties and everything. And then yeah. without the beauties, you need the tragedies for everything to balance out. Like you're saying the yin and yang. At the star, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? So that's like, this is what it's all about. And, and, and the head noise that people might have, like people are going to listen to this, you know, driving to work or, you know, people are going to listen to this, going to the gym and they're going to be like, fuck it, I want to do it. Fuck it, I want to do it. But it's just like listening to you speak and the head noise that you've just been a part of, like you've had it, like mate, you've been laying on your back, like you said, looking at the clouds, like the head noise there or laying down, looking at the hospital roof, the head noise that you had, like, had at that time and to manage that and rewire that as motivation to, you know, do this tomorrow, like the little challenges you said, like to do these little things, you know, and and decide, well, you know what, I'm going to be the best version of myself, no matter what that looks yeah. like, you know. When also, I think sometimes is that, you know, when life hits you hard, when life chucks a difficulty at you, you know, that's like, I see that as like, you can either see it as dirt, where, you know, it's dirt on you, you get dirty and it's ugly and it's bad and puts you down, it's horrible. Or you can see it as fertilizer. It can help you grow. It can help you, you know, improve and become better and get bigger and stronger and mentally and physically and achieve more, you know what I mean? So I think it just depends, like I said at the start, when difficulties come at you, it can either be the worst thing ever or it can be a trampoline and make it the best thing ever. And if you capitalize upon those difficulties and, you know, channel it into progressing and becoming the best person that you can be, then difficulty to be very powerful, man. And I think people that don't go through difficulties in life, people that have it easy, they make money easily or they get given money from their parents um, or, you know, their parents buy them a house or they just never go through any challenges in life. I think mm. I feel sorry for those people, man. Yeah, man. Because they don't know how to appreciate things. And when a little difficulty does come their way, they don't know what to do, man. They shit yeah. themselves. They're like, I'm not used to this. And... That's why so many people, like in my book, which we'll get to soon, in the book I talk about the billionaire and the poor kid analogy or example. And so I'll tell you now. So it's they're at a restaurant. This billionaire is at a restaurant, right? Really fancy restaurant, five-star, a Michelin star. He gets a you know, $400 piece of steak and a glass of red wine that was like 600 bucks. And he asks for a medium rare, right? And the steak comes to his plate and it's like slightly above medium rare. It's medium. And then he goes, he cuts it, goes to eat it and he goes, calls over the way, he goes, this tastes like shit. Like, this is not what I wanted. This is so bad. It's the worst piece of steak I've ever had. But then a poor kid is on the side of the street and someone gives him a little sausage from Coles and he hasn't ate in weeks and that's his first food, that little sausage from Coles and he thinks that is the best food he's ever had in his life. And the reason that that kid is euphoric off that, off that small sausage roll and the billionaire is 
miserable from that really nice expensive piece of steak is because of perception because that billionaire doesn't know how to appreciate the things because he hasn't experienced mm. bad times. So whereas the kid has experienced really bad times, so that okay time for us is euphoric for him. Mm. So it's all relative. So, you know, the way I see it is in life, you've got to keep your standards low, appreciate the small things, and that's how you'll find happiness at all times. And those difficulties in life enable you to appreciate those good things. And so... People that don't go through challenges, I feel sorry for you. Yeah, man, man, I 100% agree. I really like what you said earlier about um, getting the dirt on you. I, I just thought it'd be a great, great Alex Noble head noise quote of when you get shit on you, you either grow or you smell. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think that's so true, man. And like you said, man, people that don't go through those like struggles or like just sort of embrace that little bit of pain, you know, like that. That's that's why I do love sport, and I'm, I'm sure the same reason that you 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 love sport too is is seeing people in that struggle. You know what I mean? Seeing people in the grind and figuring it out. You know what I mean? And obviously, like you do that every single day with your physio um, rehab, which I which sorry we got we we should get back to is is that journey. So we we last talked about your journey from uh, learning to breathe, and so what were the steps um, after that? What what were the steps sort of when you learned how to breathe by yourself after those? three days being awake and you sort of um so do you start to figure it out or yeah so yeah like i said first step seeing the time of that clock yep second step really learning how to breathe which you talked about and then it was relearning how to drink um and eat food drinking came first because it's more liquidized or liquidated sorry yep. so it's easier and then the next stage after that was learning how to eat so i remember that was another process we had like i had my own um uh, speech pathologist who would help me develop relearning how to drink and eat. So she'd bring in like different types of foods and different types of liquid. I remember, but I first started with ice and honestly in the ICU period for like five and a half, six days, I was unable to have any water at all. And so like you never would have thought of this, but not having water for six days was also probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Really? Like my mouth was like shredded, like blood and like cuts everywhere just because I've had no liquid out at all in my mouth for like six days yeah. and with masks on like tubes down my mouth and throat. And so, yeah, I couldn't even swallow. Like I just swallowed then, but I couldn't do that. Mm. I had no saliva. It was just drier than like the Saharan desert, bro. It was, Fuck. I remember I would literally lie there dreaming about, I used to have this, protein shaker with a black lid yeah. and after I'd, I'd have a protein shake in the morning but then afterwards I'd clean it out and fill it up with water take it around me throughout school the other day yeah, yeah. and so I just neck water from it and like it'll glug 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 yeah. and that's, oh, that's exactly how it sounds yeah. yeah and so <laughs> when I was lying there I remember I was just daydreaming about drinking from that <laughs> bottle eh? like oh man you got no idea like, wow. but I remember when I first got that piece of ice it was like such a tease because it was like the first bit of liquid, but yeah. I, no, I couldn't swallow anything still. Yeah, yeah. But that's how I had to relearn. That was my first stage of relearning how to drink by having an ice cube in my mouth. And then eventually we got to water. Then it was onto this really liquidated yogurt. And then it was like mashed banana. Then it was like another different type of yogurt, like a yolk plate or something, which was actually the first bit of good stuff that I had yeah. of like seven or eight days. And then just slowly working through the foods. Um, and I remember when I was in the intensive care, you know, my mates, a few of my closest mates visited me and our favorite food used to be, um, a gallows. Oh and, yeah. And so what, we used to get Jamie it all there? the time. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if Jamie was there. Because Jamie loves it. Yeah, like, Jamie loves it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think it was Dylan, Connor and Jaden, I think, and Zane. Shout out the boys. Sure, yeah. Shout out the boys. boys. And um, I remember mean, they brought me a gala and a Dolcini's chocolate freddo, which was our favorite mix. And so... They brought in their gallows and gave, fed me a chip. And I started eating it and just fucking started choking. I eh? like, because I couldn't swallow it. Oh, I just, like, so yeah. they, oh, they skipped so the I process. Started, yeah. So I started like choking on the potato. I couldn't swallow it at all. Oh, fuck. So then the doctors and nurses had to rush in and all this. Everyone's the, freaking. The boys shat themselves. Oh, no, I'm going to kill him. But yeah, that's what it was like. And then 
But eventually... That's so fucked yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. That's so <laughs> fucked up. Pretty the funny. boys were trying so hard to be like, yeah, nice. No, it was the first time we saw each other as well as since the accident. <laughs> trying to be good blokes, but they trying to kill me. Oh, fuck. That's nah, so that was good. Funny. It was a good memory. It was funny. That's fucking um, funny. But yeah, so that was just like an example. And then I think, oh, I forget how long, like maybe a week, a week and a half. And I finally relearned how to pretty much eat mm, like 70% of foods. Okay. And yeah, so after that, and then it was the physical rehabilitation and recovery. So as I said, in the intensive care, nothing except my eyes. And uh, the first step was like moving my head eventually just by slowly regaining the neural pathways after the injury. And then it was, you know, shoulder shrugs. And then three and a half weeks after my accident, I finally got into the upstairs spinal cord unit. Mm. Where I could, where there was a gym. Are you, sorry, sorry to interrupt. This is at North Shore Hospital. Yeah, are, you, are you talking at this point? Can you? Uh, yes, I can talk at this point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so when you so, started eating, you could get your voice. Yeah, when back. I was eating, I could talk. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah, cool, yeah. cool. So yeah, because like um, breathing, um, talking, drinking, eating, and then the physical yeah. recovery. Cool. And so yeah, three and a half weeks after my accident, I got back in the gym for the, my first time up in the spinal cord um, injury unit at North Shore Hospital. And I remember we started because I couldn't lift my arms at all. Yeah. Um, we started with by removing gravity. So they put my arms in a sling or in two arms in the slings. So there was no gravity involved. So it was just me, pure like just strength without because mm. gravity is actually pretty heavy. Like well for me at the time, um, there was just no hope going against gravity. So we moved it, put it in the slings. And then we tried to start by just moving my hands slightly like this, by just like a centimeter, and just slowly working to be able to one day be able to get my hand to my chin. Um, so yeah, just days and days and hours in the sling, just working on it, trying to get my um, biceps going. And then eventually after the slings, we were leveled up and we moved to a table where I put my arm on a slide sheet on the table because without the slide sheet, I wouldn't be able to move yeah, yeah. my arm back and forth just because of friction. So they removed the friction by putting the slide sheet. So then it was like trying to go back and forth like this. Um, so that was more like shoulder work, like anterior deltoids and um, rear deltoids. And then uh, weeks after that, then I got into the hand cycle. And so the hand cycle is when it's pretty much like, yeah, you, both your hands are locked into a bar and you cycle just like, oh, yeah, okay. just like that. So I initially started with it automated helping me because I couldn't rotate it yeah. myself. So it started with just the device automating it for me and I would just try and do as much as I can along with it. And then eventually I was able to do it by myself. And then, you know, months and months and months after, I must have been, in, I think seven or something, I then did my first stand. And so wow. just throughout that period, those seven months were just, yeah, the relentless day in, day out, not seeing any improvements ever. Um, that's but that's know, what it is. Hey, tedious. It's yeah. it's almost like like um, like the gym though. Like you know what I mean. Like what you've already been used to. You know what I mean. It's just like you do all this exercise. You know, you do it for one week. Don't see anything. Don't do it two weeks. Don't see anything. Three weeks. A month. Two months. And then you start to see a little bit of a change. And then you start to see yeah. like a progression. And then it's sort of that process. Well, for me at least, was like addictive. Like, you know, because I remember, like, let's be honest, when we knew each other, I was a really fat kid. Like, I was, like, 115 kilos. Yeah. Like, I was a super fat kid. And I was, like, in your right. Yeah. <laughs> Dead set was. I was a massive prop for, like, at that, uh, that, that time. And then when I sort of realized, I'm like, I don't really want to be the fat kid anymore. And I was, like, I stopped, you know, focused on my eating and started training. And yeah. that process got addictive of, oh, I'm losing weight. Oh, I'm looking, you know, I'm getting stronger. And is that what helped you? Sort of that mindset that you had already from training yeah. and everything? Nah, that's good. Good question. Um, you'll see in the book, I go into detail about this as well. But when I used to gym, like what you're saying, is I would see results and those results would motivate me to get back in the gym. Like you're saying it's addictive mm. because you see the results. You see you're losing weight. You see you're benching more. You see you're deadlifting more. You see like shit. You get back in the gym to do more, to do more. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, deadlift yeah. more, to lose more weight. You know what I mean? So that is what motivated me to continually gym back before my injury. Right. But the recovery process of rehab, I didn't see those results like because it was so slow and right. so much more tedious and 
so minimal. Like I'm doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just like, it's nothing like what it used to be like. So there was no motivation there because I wasn't motivated to gym because I wasn't seeing results. Right. So, you know, I wasn't addicted to it. I didn't like going back to the gym because I'm like, why the hell am I doing this? I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not right. seeing any results. Yeah. There's no point in this. Why am I doing this? Like I could just stay in bed. It'll be the same result. You know what I mean? But I just knew that. And that's what I had to do. I didn't, I was, I, I, I moved away from being motivated and motivated to gym based on the results, but I chose to be disciplined. You know, I didn't feel like doing gym, mm. but you know, I should do the gym because even if I can't see the results, I know that in the end, you know, it will, I will be better than I was. Even if I don't see the results now, this today or tomorrow or the next week or the next month. But I know that in a year's time or two years time or even five years time or 10 years time, I'll be a bit better than I was. Mm. And also even I, even if I don't, see or become better than i was i would know that at least i tried you know what i mean yeah so i knew that i hated it didn't want to do it sucked but i knew that i should did it so i should do it so i did it you know what i mean okay. and i think that's what discipline is you know discipline is doing what you should do not what you want to do you know acting for your future self not your current self mm. prioritizing the person tomorrow not the person today exactly because that's the way i pitched it and focused on it and avoided from or moved away from being motivated to disciplined and, you know, taking it one step at a time. Man, that's mad. I like that, moving away from motivated to disciplined. I really like that. That's good. And now, you, as you are saying, you got your first stand. And and what was that like? Was, was that just like, fuck, this is crazy? Uh, well, you'd think that it would be like that, but and I thought it would be like that too. Um, you know, first time standing again. Mm. It would be an amazing, blissful moment. But to be honest, it was pretty weird and dodgy to be honest like so i was at neuromoves which is like this advanced rehabilitation center it was in lidcombe and they have all this like advanced technology okay. and treadmills and you know all this stuff to help regain and regenerate neural pathways that's kind of the idea of the um that rehab center and so i remember rocking up there when i was still at rehab I went for a day trip out there and we um we're sitting on the edge of this bed, a bed that could raise up and down like the physio beds. And so I was laying down on the bed with my legs, legs hanging off the bed and I had five physios with me. And so we were doing some arm exercises or whatever. And then the physio said to me, all right, we're going to try to get you to stand. And then I just started laughing at him. I'm like, what are you on about? Like, I've not even thought about trying to stand. Yeah. Like you, you're crazy pretty much. But you know what I mean? I was just like, well, accept it as it comes, oh, do it fuck whatever. It. <laughs> fuck it, yeah, why not? <laughs> See what happens. Like, there's five visitors. Hopefully, I shouldn't get injured or whatever. So, we they sat me up on the edge of the bed. So my legs were hanging down off the bed, touched just touching the floor. And I was sitting at the end of the physio bed, and there was um, one physio in front of me who was sitting on a rolly chair, and he was blocking my knees with his knees. Right. And they started raising the physio bed up as high as possible, just to the point where my toes were still touching the ground. The idea of that was because obviously the higher up you are, the less range of movement you have to do to, to be able to stand. Yeah. So to make it easy as possible for my first time. So physio was in front of me blocking my knees and holding my knees. And he also had a, a blue foam in between our knees and with a strap around it to lock our knees together. I had a physio behind me to catch me if I fell backwards. I had a physio on the right side of me to help me stop him from falling on the right and the same on the left. And then there was also a physio behind the physio at my knees who was holding this frame thing, which I was, which I had my arms on. Mm. And so they put the bed all the way up and pretty much they all grabbed onto me and they said, all right, we're going to try a stand. And so pretty much they let me forward. And then I, all I had to do was that tiny little leg out, like lock the legs. And so with every bit of strength that I had, like I was shaking and, you know, try like my face nearly broke because I was squeezing so hard. <laughs> Flexing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I did it. Wow. And so that was my first time standing. And, you know, it would think blissful, but I felt like, you know, those um, car dealerships where the balloon man's out the front <laughs> like this? <laughs> the guy with the arm yeah, going, that, yeah. that's exactly what I felt like, you know. It's completely no control over myself. Wow. No balance, completely destabilized. Um, you know, I had no control of my body at all, but I was up there just floating around like by the physios holding on to me and they tried to like re let go a little bit um just to enable me to try yeah to yeah, yeah, but yeah yeah so then i just felt like the the, the balloon balloon. guy at the car dealership that's so, so funny but yeah that was the first time i stood and then from there yes it wasn't 
easy and yes, it was dodgy and yes, it was nothing like a normal stand, but what it gave me was hope. Yeah. You know, it gave me hope that maybe one day I could stand again. Maybe one day, maybe it's not out of, um, maybe it, it, it is an option to regain leg movement. Maybe yeah. I won't be just in a wheelchair my whole life, you know, but I always thought that was an option, but that enabled, that unlocked that possibility. And I think that was why it was so powerful. So from that moment on, then it was just going ham at the legs, trying to strengthen the legs up as much as possible, trying to lower that bed each time and try to get more range of movement, try to stand up my own more. And so, yeah, just again, day in and day out. Now it wasn't only just little arm movements, but it was also, you know, leg movements too. Yeah. So just, yeah, just strived as hard as I possibly could to regain as much movement as I could to be able to stand as much as I could. And nowadays I can do a squat with 20 kilograms on my back. So Really? Yeah. Wow, from man. Like, from like 90 degrees too, so. Fuck, from a 90. Yeah. Mate, most people out there that go to the gym don't do 90. That's yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah. Man, that's... I don't think I used to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing, man. Yeah. That's, that's, fuck. I can see the smile on your face like it. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. It's been a process, man. Yeah, it's been a journey, hey. So, so was that... How long ago was that um, of your first stand? How many? Was that you for two years the ago? The first stand, like the one at... Yeah, your very first one, the dodgy oh, that one. Was, that was when I was still at rehab, so that was about eight months after my accident. Okay, and and now it's been... How long has it been? Now it's nearly about five and a half, five, three quarters. Yeah, wow. And five and a half, yeah. Yeah, and now you're squatting with 20 kilos and you're back yeah. at 90 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, just this morning I did it actually as well. This yeah. morning? You just yeah. did legs this morning? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> legs, on a, legs on a Thursday is crazy. Yeah, mate. Legs every day. Every day? Well, every single morning... After I go through my morning routine to get up, I do 20 minutes of stands at 90 degrees on my bed. So 20 minutes just up, down squats before wow. I get on my day, um, before light, you know, get up yep. nice and early. It enabled me the time to do my stands. Yep. And then every time before bed, before my one and a half hour nightly routine, I do 20 minutes of stands One again. and a half hour nightly routine? Well, yeah, the morning is two and a half, and night time is one and a half. Wow. Can you go through that for me? The morning yeah, routine? Yeah. So yeah, that's what I mean. That's another thing about... Yeah. Not being unaware about like... Well, you even didn't even bring it up because you just like... Yeah, oh. well, there's just so many, right? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I just like... It's just what I have to go through. Like, it's natural now. Yeah. But so, so for, for people out there, they have like, I had no idea, hey. What but fuck? I don't realise that you have no idea, but it's actually fair enough that you don't. Because <laughs> you're not exposed to, you know... Yeah, you don't. Mind. You just don't. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, morning routine, two and a half hours. So, the, uh, my support worker comes at like 5.30 in the morning, 6. Yep. Um, they... Rock up, wake me up, and they chuck the light on. And then I usually, you know, neck a bottle of water in the morning. That's just like what everyone does. But then they disconnect my night bag. And then we go to the toilet. I won't go on that too much. Shower, they help me shower, um, which that isn't just a quick shower or a quick toilet. It's quite a long process. Right, okay. Um, but then, yeah, back in the room. Then they help me stand out of the shower chair, um, spin back onto the bed where I do, you know, the moisturizer face and dressed up. Um, Get, get pretty, clothed, get clay, yeah, get, get pretty. pretty, and that's a process, you know, rolling and then one leg at a time, one leg at a time, the, yeah. them helping you. So, yeah, all up, two and a half hour process, and then, um, and that's why I get up so early too, because it is such a process. Yeah. And you know, if I got up at like times where other people get up, like my mates who get up at like eight or whatever, well, then I'll be starting my day at like 10 30. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, it's fair if I start at eight, but then I'll be starting at 10 30, so then I'm falling behind, then I will become inferior to others. So I'm like, fuck that. I'm getting up early. Yes, it's unfair. Like I have to get up way earlier than everybody else, but that's what it takes in order yeah. to keep well, up with everybody else, but not only keep up to be better yeah. than other people. So yeah, it's unfair, but that's what it takes. You know what I mean? So, um, and then on top of that, yeah, the, the 20 minutes of stands, which I usually end up doing more than 20 minutes. Like I set a timer on my Alexa. I go, Alexa, set a 20 minute timer every single morning, every single <laughs> night, literally. Um, but usually my alarm goes off. I go, Alexa, stop. And then, I just keep doing more because I love standing because like, you know, I don't get it that much during the day. So yeah. let's get hammered. At it. Um, and then at night time, you know, after I've had like a, you know, like a 16 hour day of work or whatever. And like, I'm completely tired and drained and all I want to do is just go to bed and sleep because I'm completely fatigued, you know, with the bags on my eyes. Cause I've tried my very best that day, which I try to do every single day of my life. Then at night time, I'm like, Oh, I just want to go to bed and hit the pillow. Then I still have to go through another whole, one and a half hour process of the nightly routine. And on top of that, I still do the 20 minutes of stands, you know, just because it's like a mandatory part of my life. I don't have to do, but I chose to make it mandatory. Um, 
and then yeah, in bed by 11, 11.30, sometimes midnight, up again at 5.36. Um, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard processes and it's a difficult and it's challenging, but you know, that's what it takes and I wouldn't be here where I am today and achieve the things that I have today if I didn't put myself mm. through those challenges and, you know, putting in that effort. But, you know, when you do try your very best, you can, it's amazing what you can achieve. Yeah, I think it's really cool too, talking about um, how um, you start the day with those tasks. You start the day winning something. And that's a big thing that a lot of people that, um, you know, like I said, able-bodied people, that they don't actually force themselves to do those tasks. Like a lot of people will get up, not make their bed, just get dressed, fucking go to work or whatever, or do what they have to do. Um, but a lot of people that have to get up and do a th- what you're doing, you're winning that first thing of the day. So when you go do your next thing, you want to go win it. You know what I mean? And and I and I feel like it builds that um addictive like mindset of like let's keep let's keep the momentum rolling now, which is um which is really cool, man. That's, yeah. that's, that's really cool. No, hundred percent. I think that like what a lot of people do is they wake up and then they reach over to their phone, take it off charge, yeah, go on tiktok or instagram for a while and then after like 30 minutes then they finally yeah. get the courage to get out of bed and on with their day and then you've started off slow and it's hard to get going man yeah. but yeah with in my life i make it yeah like what you said starting off the morning routine and winning the morning and get up early and then doing the stands you know accomplishing mm. a task and i make a conscious effort which i'll you can also read in the book i talk about this in detail too you know making a conscious effort to hit and accomplish tasks early and then when you accomplish that task it motivates you to accomplish another task and when you hit that task another one you know mm, and so yeah. the way i do that and the strategy that i do or implement to you know keep that going forward and keep accomplishing tasks and maximize the days i use my calendar really thoroughly i got this yeah beast calendar on my phone and pretty much i schedule every single task of the day on it. oh really and by doing that it enables me to give myself a time limit on the task too. And also by, by putting my tasks all on the calendar, it gets out of my head. So it removes stress too. Yeah. So when I see it on paper, it's like, okay, I don't have to memorize what I have to do. It's all there. Now I just need to do it. And also by doing that in, on my calendar, it's got like a red line, which is like the time. And as the time goes on throughout the day, the red line goes down the page. Oh, so it's cool. like you know, 10 o'clock, 10 01, 10 02. And so when that red line timer goes over the task in my calendar, it's pretty much showing the time period that I have to complete it by. And yeah, so if yeah. I didn't have that, and if I didn't schedule my tasks, I would say to myself, it's like, oh, I'll just do it in a bit. Oh, I'll just go on Instagram for a bit. But because I'm only giving myself like an hour, mm. I have to get it done in an hour because the minute after that, I've got a new task scheduled. So I make sure that every single minute of the day has got a task there because, you know, if there's no task there, then I can just go on Instagram for a bit and shift that task back. Yeah. But yeah. by doing task after task back to back, then you know make sure I, I make sure that I complete that task in that time period, and then by the end of the day, you know I pumped out like three times more than I would have because I didn't give myself that time to finish it slower or you know not off for a bit or go away and go on Instagram for a bit or you know what I mean so I have to get it done in that period so then. Yeah, like I said, I'd accomplish three times more than I would than if I didn't use the calendar or if I didn't schedule those tasks or, you know, like what I used to do. Now, now I'm accomplishing, you know, 10 times more than I used to do in a day. Yeah, and, and may I 100% agree. And, and talking about what you have accomplished, you know, like you said, you've got these massive long days. And I think um, you should talk about these massive long days. Um, you do a lot of speaking, you know. You're doing a lot of um, speaking to schools and speaking to... Um, organizations and you know what, what what's that process been like you know like you said that you said to me in the elevator on the way up here you uh, just spoke to Cranbrook yeah yeah so what, what's what's like that you know going to your ro- old rival schools you, yeah. would you ever go to Kings would you ever go to Kings or no, nah? we're no, not, we're no. Not. <laughs> I don't hold grudges yeah <laughs> um yeah no the speaking engagements are I love them yeah do um quite a few of them the last week I did six um and yeah, it's, it's at the start, it was a new process for me. Like I hated public speaking. Yeah. Were you scared? You know? Were you ever nervous? Oh mate, I got, I was so scared and so nervous. Yeah. I remember the first time I did one after my accident and probably the first proper one in my life, you know, I did not want to do it at all, but I got asked to do it. And my first initial answer was like, no way. I'm not like that. <laughs> I don't like public speaking, you know, but 
then I realized that the only reason I'm saying no is because I would be nervous and because my emotions would get the better of me mm. because, you know, I'd be vulnerable and scared and I could stuff up and embarrass myself and fail. But like, but look at the other side. Like you have the opportunity to inspire people and benefit people and make the world a better place, you know? So am I going to not do that just because I feel scared? It's like, no, you got to embrace that vulnerability, embrace that discomfort because when you embrace those vulnerabilities and when you feel nervous and you feel uncomfortable, they, those moments are when you grow and achieve and succeed the most, you know? That's when you make the biggest impact. And so I realized that I needed to embrace those moments, embrace my discomfort in order to be the best that I can possibly be. And it's so true. And so now every time I do a speaking engagement, I'm like, don't want to, but yes, I'm going to do it. And that's how I'm going to make the biggest indent on this world that I possibly can. So yeah, I'm doing heaps of speaking engagements. I do like primary schools, high schools, you know, corporates, um, uh, charities, um, awesome. yeah, all types and uh, sports teams too. And even trying to get into NRL at the moment and the New South Wales Waratahs t- in discussions. Oh, yeah. So yeah, things are going well. Um, but the idea is just to, you know, share my message and my philosophies and the lessons that I've learned to as many people as possible in order to, in order for people to acquire and adopt those philosophies that I've shared, implement into their own life on whatever the path they may be on, in order, and then that will you know help them to achieve whatever goal they're pursuing, whether that's just to be happy, to get rich, or to start a business, or to improve Anything. your relationships, or yeah. you know help be healthy, or yeah. you know anything. It's I think that's endless, hey? yeah. I think that's like also why like with my book and my keynote speaking and these podcasts is that it's not targeted at a specific audience. It's for all demographics and all occupations. Mm. Like the message that I share yeah, isn't just for people in my situation. It's for, you know, business people. It's for all types. And yeah, I think that's why I try to share it as far and wide as possible because, you know, everyone goes through their challenges. Like, yeah, I went through one challenge, but everyone goes through those difficulties. And so I know that. And so if people can hear what I have to say and, you know, adopt some of the lessons that I've learned and implement in their own lives to help them overcome those challenges, then I think that that's my goal in life and, you know, it's my purpose to um, facilitate that. Yeah, that's awesome, brother. That's awesome. I love, I love hearing you talk about it. I can see it's so... You're very passionate about it, and I, yeah. I love, I love, I love. It sounds weird. I just love watching you talk <laughs> about it. Like it gets me going, man. It gets me motivated. And um, uh, we'll wrap up soon, man. But I was just wanted to talk um about your book. So you know, promote your book. Do do your thing. Like what's yeah. what's the book about? What's it? What's it? Where, where can people get it? You know, and yeah. So I recently published uh my new book, I Fight You Fight. It came out uh last Wednesday. And so it's available now to purchase and read across all of Australia and all the bookshops and um, all book retailers. And it's also online at you know, Amazon and uh, Dimmix and on Spotify and it's on Audible and eBook. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's called I Fight You Fight. And the main thing that I want to say about the book is that it's not my story. It's my story, but more importantly, my message yeah. and the things I've learned along the way and the strategies that I used and implemented to overcome challenges and the strategies that I share are there for people to also utilize in their own life, even though it's a completely different avenue. So, yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about what's actually in the book and, you know, something that's uh, sort of the structure of it. Yeah. So the book is my story and my journey but more importantly, it is my mindset on a piece of paper. It's my perspective of life on a piece of paper. It's all the strategies that I utilized in my life and my journey of recovery and up until who I am today, all those strategies that I used you know, to overcome challenges, to overcome difficulties and strategies that I use you know, every single day of my life. They're all filtered throughout the whole book and you know, it's, it's my message. It's all the lessons that I've learned throughout my journey and I'm, it's all there for people to, you know, adopt and implement into their own lives to overcome whatever challenges they're facing in their life, no matter what path they may be on. And so in the book, there's this thing called the noble way, which is essentially 
yeah, it's my message that I'm sharing for people to adopt and utilize and implement in their own lives on whatever road they may be on in life, even though it's completely separate to mine. But I feel like it is still relevant and can still be utilized and implemented in your own life to, you know, overcome challenges and overcome difficulties and, you know, overcome adversity and not only overcome them, but transcend them and be the best person that you can possibly be. There, that is why I wrote the book and the strategies that I talk about and the mindset that's in the book is there for you to hopefully use and um, benefit you. And so I wrote this thing called The Noble Way, which is essentially a consolidated version of my approach to life. The Noble Way is something I've been working on for three or four years. And it's, yeah, just a, it's who I am as a person. It's how I approach life. It's how I approach situations, how I approach every day. And it's how I approach becoming the best person that I can be and fulfilling my potential and my purpose. And so what The Noble Way is, is it involves four stages. So stage one involves taking control over your mind. So, you know, controlling your judgments and um, developing the ability for your mind to be stronger than your emotions. So that's stage one. There's all strategies implemented throughout that stage and you'll read that in the book. Stage two is peace. So I talk about how, you know, the key to life is finding a state of peace, not pursuing happiness, not chasing happiness, finding an internal state of peace and balance, which stabilizes you and enables you to confront all situations and, you know, I talk about various strategies to find that peace as well. Um, like, you know, finding gratitude, but not only gratitude when things are good and when the sun's shining, but also more importantly and more powerfully when things are bad, when life tries to knock you down. But if, if you can find gratitude throughout those moments in life, that will enable you to find peace. Mm. And when you're in a state of peace, man, you can become resilient and you won't be knocked off your horse when things don't go your way. And that takes me to the third stage, resilience. And so that's all about, you know, being resilient when life storms come your way. And I talk about a bunch of strategies to about being resilient when approaching those goals in life and approaching those tasks, you know, when approaching your homework or your exams or uni or your job or a big project at work or making that sporting team or, you know, winning the grand final. It's all, yeah, strategies about how to be resilient, essentially. So they're the first three stages and by mastering those three stages of the noble way, we will then be able to grow and achieve in whatever we put our mind to in life, whatever we're pursuing. And so when we get to that stage of growing and achieving that goal we're trying to pursue, then the question remains, you know, how much can we grow? How much can we achieve? You know, who can we become? What is our potential? And so that fourth stage of grow and achieve goes into three subsections about how to maximize your growth and achievements. And so those three subsections are, one is acceptance, you know, distinguishing between what's controllable and uncontrollable. When the uncontrollables come, accepting them, brushing them off, accepting the fact that it is what it is and what that does, it enables you to propel forward and carry on with your life. And with the controllables, well, identify those and capitalize upon them and enhance them, you know? And that stage one, acceptance, the power of acceptance, which is actually a really hard thing to do because, you know, as I said, people so often find, play the victim card or, mm. you know, say, why me? And so if you can develop the ability to accept what you can't change, then you've fulfilled the first subsection, acceptance. Stage, uh, subsection two is um, discipline. So, you know, not doing what you want to do, doing what you should do prioritizing yourself tomorrow not the person today you know thinking about your future self not your current self You're acting for that future person so that's all about discipline and also strategies about how to be disciplined and then the third subsection is all about vulnerability and discomfort and embracing vulnerability and discomfort you know embracing it capitalizing upon it in order to really grow and expand because the further away you are from your comfort zone, the more you are to achieve and grow, you know? Getting out of your comfort zone, you know, getting off the couch and having cups of tea and actually getting vulnerable, feeling nervous, you know, getting goosebumps, you know, mm -hmm. those moments are, it's those moments where you really 
live and you really grow as a person and achieve things and that is how you you know live a substantial life and make a significant impact and be extraordinary you know what i mean so by mastering those three subsections that is how you'll maximize and fulfill your growth and achievements and by you know mastering those stages of the noble way the three sections of the three first stages the three subsections of grow and achieve that's how you will really get to the end and realize that you've become the person that you were capable of becoming yeah that is how you reach your full potential and live a fulfilled maximized life with no regrets you know no. um so that's a noble way that's uh, awesome man yeah. that's awesome i love that i love that noble way that's awesome it might be a bit clearer in the book when there's like um diagrams and <laughs> break, break, breaking circles down easily. points but yeah. it's actually it's actually really simple if you um yeah write it in like a flow chart or a diagram yeah well. but i read the book it breaks it down a lot clearer and more detailed and i think that um well, i hope that it can benefit whoever reads it in whatever i think it will brother i think it will path it yeah it whatever path sure. you're on in life and um yeah if you do read it whoever's listening i would love to hear what you think of it and yep. um i hope it can really help you mate 100 percent. and i've got i actually got a question here that i should have asked earlier but you're obviously going to be a big inspiration for a lot of people but who inspires you you know, like who, who's someone that you look up to and you take a lot of, like a lot of their wisdom, their knowledge, their attitude, you know? Because obviously you got shaped, you didn't, you weren't shaped like this straight out, straight off the gate. What helped you get shaped like this? You know what I mean? Yeah, the biggest, in the early days throughout rehab and hospital, my biggest inspiration and what motivated me and, you know, forced me to get back up when things got tough was literally my family friends and community yeah, okay. and I know that just sounds generic or whatever but what they did to support me when I when they realized that I got injured you know the extent that I went to like the messages from everybody the comments from everybody the you know we started a meal train people started like donut cooking meals and donating meals to me just so I didn't have to eat the hospital food um that's chat, awesome yeah it was awesome. awesome the charity events you know all these support from all these people that I didn't even know and that's what like that gave me no choice to give up because if I, if I gave up, you know, I'd be letting them down. So I feel like they gave me, yeah, they forced me to, you know, strive forward when things get tough and be the best that I can be and recover and train as much as I possibly can. They motivated me and inspired me to do that. Um, and I think they did that and supported me because I inspired them too. So there's like an interrelationship between us. And yeah. I think that was a powerful force, you know. Yeah, bouncing but, off each other, you know. Yeah, exactly. And um, nowadays though, or well, the past few years and up until like who I am today, if I had to choose one inspiration, it would be Marcus Aurelius. He's my biggest oh, who's inspiration. That? I'm not sure who that is. He's an ancient Roman philosopher. He, oh, um, he's the like father of Stoicism. You've heard of Stoicism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stoics, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Stoics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like Stoic philosophy, like pretty much all about courage. And um, my, my favorite book ever is called The Daily Stoic. And it's all like Marcus Aurelius' meditations and pretty much all these you know, messages that he shares and um, strategies. And yeah, he was a Roman emperor, um, but he had a really, really tough life. Yeah, it was Roman empire, but all of the other shit going on in their life, like he you know, had to you know, run armies and he was, he was really sick too and his brother died young and all this stuff. Um, and so yeah, he yeah, wrote books and wrote meditations and just his wisdom, it was like thousands of years ago, but still to this day, it is so relevant and so powerful and impactful for so many and it's definitely made a big impact on me and helped shape my, and then helped me shape my mindset and also enabled me to understand my brain and articulate my message and the strategies that I implemented so that I can express it and verbalize it and share it with others. And so, yeah, he's probably, if I had to choose one, he'd be my biggest inspiration. Yeah, well, man. I was not expecting that answer. Yeah, like, no one is really. Like mine's pretty bad. Like mine's like LeBron or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yours is really deep and like yeah, nah. really smart. <laughs> no, nah, well, cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Remember to get a copy of I Fight, You Fight on everything. Yeah. <laughs> Not everything. <laughs> Buy it twice. <laughs> no, nah, well, I think I really appreciate you coming, man. I think I think a lot of people are going to really take a lot of inspiration out of this and, and best of luck with the book and... I'm sure I'll see you down at the sheep suit or something. <laughs> <laughs> nah, thanks so much for having me. It's been awesome to chat and hopefully um, you know, the things we've talked about go far and wide.
My man, my man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks for coming, brother.